Good afternoon. I'm Susan Weber, and joining Walker and Dunlop CEO Willie Walker today is Maryland Governor Larry Hogan. They will discuss the state of politics in America, the future of the Republican Party, leadership during COVID-19, and the importance of integrity. Thank you for joining us today, and now over to Willie. Thank you, Susan, and uh, good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast, and good morning to those of you to points further west, uh, and good afternoon, Governor. Uh, let me do a brief introduction to the governor and then I will get into uh, our discussion. Uh, governor Lawrence J. Hogan Jr. was sworn in as the 62nd governor of the state of Maryland on January 21st, 2015. In 2018, he was overwhelmingly reelected to a second four-year term, receiving the most votes of any Maryland gubernatorial candidate and becoming only the second Republican governor to be reelected in the 242-year history of the state. In his first inaugural address, Governor Hogan reminded citizens of Maryland's history as a state of middle temperament and pledged to advance the best ideas, regardless of which side of the political aisle they come from. He is recognized nationally as a strong, independent leader who consistently delivers real results and achieves common sense, bipartisan solutions. After being elected by his fellow governors, Governor Hogan recently completed a successful term as chairman of the National Governors Association, and he has consistently maintained one of the highest job approval ratings in the country. Prior to his stellar political career, Governor Hogan founded Hogan Companies in 1985, which engaged in brokerage, consulting, investment, and development of land, commercial, and residential real estate for 18 years. Governor Hogan went to Florida State University, where he earned a Bachelor's of Arts degree in government and political science. So first, Governor, it is a true honor to have you with us today. I wanna to thank you very much for taking the time out of your exceedingly busy and demanding schedule to share your thoughts and views. And I think most importantly, leadership lessons with our listeners today. Well, thank you very much, Willie. It's, it's really wonderful to be with you. I've been looking forward to this and uh, I, I thank you very much for the opportunity. So Governor, you grew up in Landover Knowles in Prince George's County, just outside of Washington, DC, as the son of a lawyer turned FBI agent turned politician. Did you ever consider becoming a lawyer and FBI agent before politics? You know, I did for a little while. When I was growing up, I thought it'd be really cool to be a, uh, a, uh, an FBI agent. And I, uh, while I was at Florida State, my plan was to go to law school. And then I got distracted by other things after graduating college and got involved in politics and commercial real estate. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I had some thoughts about that, but I, I really wanted to be a basketball coach when I was younger, so more so than an FBI agent or a lawyer. That, that, that's really interesting. I, I'm, I'm hopeful at the end of this, we're going to get you to say that you're going to run for president of the United States, but uh, might we look at you being the next uh, Johns Hopkins basketball coach after you step down as Possibly. governor of the great state of, of Maryland? I might, I might want to start with like a, a boys club or, you know, some younger kids. I'm not sure I'm, I'm at the college level quite yet. <laughs> so. Governor, your father served three terms in Congress and gave up a safe seat uh, to run for governor. But one piece of his background that I found so informative as it relates to you is that your father was the first Republican member of the House Judiciary Committee to call for the impeachment of President Nixon. And as I've heard you tell it, your father was insistent upon that process being fair and transparent. But once your father had realized that the president should be impeached, he was the first to step out there and take that stance. And I think that's so reflective or insightful as it relates to your character and if you will, independence as a political leader. You wanna talk for that about it for a moment and, and when you watched your father do that? Well, sure. And thanks for bringing that up. I, I you know, I, uh, I learned so much about uh, integrity and public service from my dad. And I was in Congress. I, I was in high school at the time when he was in co uh, Congress and serving on the House Judiciary Committee. And he was a he was a loyal Republican who had supported Nixon and his campaigns and, and uh, thought that he was doing a pretty good job as president. And he fought very hard to, when he thought that the Democrats were being unfair and fought to make sure he could cross examine witnesses. But as you pointed out, as a former FBI agent and, uh, and a Georgetown uh, trained lawyer, after seeing all the evidence, uh, he you know, came, came to the conclusion that the president had committed impeachable offenses and he was the first one on the House Judiciary Committee to say that, the first Republican. He's the only Republican to vote for all three articles of impeachment and uh, President Nixon in this memoir uh, says he made the decision to resign the presidency after, after that speech he gave before the House Judiciary Committee. So, all these years later, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's still 
pertinent today. And I, I lost my dad just a couple of years ago. Uh, I was so proud that he got to see me be elected governor. Uh, and, I, and I eulogized him. And I said, that's the moment that he was most remembered for in history. And I'm awful proud of him. So, Governor, many people who would have lived that moment and seeing, if you will, the pressure your father was under by stepping out there, to some degree, people could go either way. They could say, I both praise that and think that's something to do. And they could also say, I'm going to shy away from that. And that's not something I ever want to put myself into. What was it there that made you really realize? Because it wasn't until later that you could kind of reflect upon that and say that was clearly the right thing to do. What was it, do you think, in your upbringing or your, your father's parenting of you that gave you, if you will, the courage to basically speak out the way you speak out today? Well, I, I, I learned a lot from him, but, you know, I spent most of my entire life in the private sector in the real estate business. And uh, this is the first elective office I've ever held. So I was I would say a late bloomer in politics and, and really enjoyed the private sector. But I always admired my dad from the very even though I was a kid in high school at the time. I remember very clearly him going through that decision making process. And he knew at the time that he was going to, you know, uh, get the wrath of many people in the party, the folks in the White House and fellow members of Congress and many of his supporters and contributors who were really angry with him for quite some time. And it, it, it really, it, decades later, looking back, I think it's uh, something that most people feel he showed tremendous courage. It's the kind of leadership I think we're lacking in Congress today for the most part. But at the time, it was pretty brutal. I mean, he, he, he ended his career. It's why he never became governor of Maryland himself and gave up his, his seat in Congress as a result of it. But he decided to do what he you know, he just had a, he was compelled to do what he thought was right, the right thing for the country, regardless of the personal consequences and put, uh, you know, the country above party. And, uh, and I, I think, obviously, I, I learned some lessons just watching, watching him and admiring him. It's very clear how much you admired your father and looked up to him. But in 1976, when you came out of Florida State University, you were a big fan of Ronald Reagan's. And it's my understanding that your father was a big fan of Jerry Ford's and had a big hand in Gerald Ford becoming vice president of the United States and then president of the United States. Um, and you both attended, I think you were one of the youngest delegates to the 1976 Republican convention in Kansas City. Was there a little tension between you and your father with your father supporting Jerry Ford and, and you supporting Ronald Reagan? Well, it's kind of a funny story. You know, kids often rebel against their uh, parents and maybe sometimes they get in a little bit of trouble and my, my rebellion was supporting Ronald Reagan over Jerry Ford. And, and it's, it's a funny story. I was actually an alternate delegate. I was still halfway through Florida State. I was a college kid. It was an exciting opportunity to go there with my dad and to participate. And I, I loved politics as a kid. And I got to march around in a little bit of a demonstration on the floor of the, of the House uh, of the convention. And I have a Reagan hat and a Reagan sign and T-shirt. And my dad got, you know, saw this going on. He's like, you know, not that he had anything against Reagan and I didn't have anything against Jerry Ford, who I knew as a kid, they were, he was friends with my dad and my dad was a Ford chairman. And he was like, what in the heck are you doing? But I was, I was pretty excited. I was later a chairman of youth for Reagan and very involved in the 80 and the 84 campaign and a delegate to, to both of those conventions. But yeah, my dad wasn't too happy about me uh, going so far out there with Reagan in 76. What was it that you saw in Reagan, because obviously in 76, you saw something in, at that time, Governor Reagan, uh, future President Reagan, that really attracted you. And, and I've heard you speak often, Governor, about a couple core tenets that Ronald Reagan stood for that, that you have kind of guided you throughout your politics. What, what was it about Ronald Reagan that pulled you to him? Well, you know, and, and, and again, let me just touch on Jerry Ford, who I had tremendous admiration for. He, my dad served in, in, in the House with him, and he was minority leader. And, of course, my dad had a role in helping him to get to be uh, vice president and president. So he was a great man who I admired. But Ronald Reagan uh, was a guy who really uh, just energized an entire generation. He, he had such a positive, hopeful vision for America. Uh, and, and he had very simple core principles about smaller government, about a stronger defense, about freedom, about standing up to, uh, you know, the Soviet Union. But it was really the way he spoke. He had a wonderful sense of humor. He was inspirational. Um, and, and, and I think, uh, you know, the, the kind of leader that I just was attracted to as a young man. And I'd say to a great degree, the type of leader that you have been. 
Well, I, I would I wouldn't make that comparison, Willie, but thank you. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think that one of the interesting things is you both. I mean, one of the things that I took from your second inaugural address was that hopeful message. Uh, and then also the sense that we'll take the best idea, no matter where it comes from, because it's the best idea for the state of Maryland, not necessarily a Republican idea or a Democratic idea. Well, you know, Ronald Reagan used to say there's no limit to what you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit. And that's one, you know, I, I, I'm full of Reagan quotes because I, I just, you know, thought he was an incredible president who transformed America and the world. Uh, but that that was a pretty simple one. And I, I, I have tried to live uh, up to that when I when I was first elected in Maryland. And this is the bluest state in America. I'm a Republican with a 70 percent. Uh, you know, pretty far left, uh, you know, progressive legislature in both houses. But I said I didn't care which side of the aisle the ideas came from. I just wanted the good ideas. And if I wanted to work on bipartisan common sense solutions. And, you know, it's something that as a kid, I saw Reagan and Tip O'Neill, you know, get things done. They didn't agree on everything and they were different parties, but they there was a camaraderie there where they would go have a beer together or they would there was a true friendship, even uh, that we, even when they competed uh, and debated issues. That they came together and got some things done for America, and I've, you know, I've, I've tried to do that. I've tried my best to, uh, you know, to, to work across the aisle, and I think we've gotten a lot of things done by finding that middle ground where we can uh, we can reach a compromise. Governor, is the is the state level on that bipartisanship just completely distinct from the national scene? And and the reason I ask that is. It, your tenure as governor reminds me a lot of George W. Bush in, in Texas. George W. Bush had a Democratic uh, state legislature. Um, he worked across the aisle um, to do many things that many didn't think were possible. He, like you, he was the first governor of the state of uh, Texas to be reelected uh, for another four-year term. Um, and yet he got to Washington I think on the premise of bipartisanship, but kind of ran into a wall of the partisan gridlock that exists in Washington, even back in 2000, much less in 2022. Is there something that's unique at the state level that you can work through that at the national level, it's almost impossible to work through? Well, look, I, I don't think it's easy even at the state level and most people don't do it, uh, but I think it's what most people in America want. They really do want to elect leaders regardless of their party affiliation that are willing to work together, that are willing to focus on solving problems. And unfortunately, that's not what's happening in Washington. You know, we're, we're uh, you know, just the state capital here in Annapolis, we're 30 miles down the road. Uh, from from the nation's capital, but we couldn't be more different. And we're actually working together and getting things done on any number of issues. And it seems as if, and I think it's worse than when when George W. Bush was president. I think it's continued to uh, get to the point where we have just such divisiveness and dysfunction in Washington. The Congress seems to be broken or hopelessly divided. And you know, occasionally, you know, we can on a particular issue come together and get something done. But I, I think there's a lot of folks that that spend more time worrying about how to win an argument on Twitter, uh, you know, rather than trying to figure out how to reach agreement and come up with a solution to a problem that people care about. I was going to ask you, is it is it a advantage or disadvantage to be so close to Washington, just as it relates to influence over national politics? Is it does everyone sort of say we see too much of you because you're right next door, and if you flew in from California, it'd be better? Or is it really an advantage to be in a state that is adjacent to the District of Columbia? Well, you know, I said maybe sometimes it seems like we're pretty far away. Uh, you know, we we do things just about completely opposite of the way they do down the road in Washington. But it we do surround the nation's capital, and we're right here in the heart of the Mid Atlantic region. And uh, you know, I think we've got a wonderful state, and we work together with our partners in the region. Uh, but it's an interesting perspective. I mean, I certainly don't have to fly in from uh, out in the heartland somewhere if uh, if there's some some important issue going on at the White House or in Congress or. You know, if we want to uh, try to be a part of what's going on, I try my best to focus on the things we're doing here in our state and 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 try to stay out of Washington, uh, you know, politics as much as I can. But it, it's an advantage to be able to be this close and uh, be able to you know get to know some of the leaders there and work on problems together. I was surprised, Governor, to hear you say that when you first campaigned for governor back in 2014, that the number one issue across all geographies in Mar in Maryland was opiates. Um, talk about that first campaign and what you learned from meeting with Marylanders around the state. 
Well, so, you know, I was just a small uh, businessman who had never held elective office and uh, in, in a state that you know, everybody was a, a Democrat. And I, I just became so frustrated with what was going on in our state because we had raised taxes 43 times in a row. We had we had we were overregulated and overtaxed. We had lost tens of thousands of businesses and hundreds of thousands of jobs. And, uh, you know, a, a Gallup poll came out that said 48 percent of all the people in our state wanted to move. And, and I just, it broke my heart as a lifelong Marylander, but it also made me kind of angry enough to want to do something about it. And I stepped up and decided to run for governor. And even my closest friends and real estate partners and, and closest associates all thought I was completely crazy. They, they said, well, you might make a pretty good governor and we agree with what you're saying, but this is Maryland. And so you're not going to be elected governor, but somehow we, you know, I just went out with a grassroots campaign. Uh, I started a group called Change Maryland. I went from to all across the state just talking to people. We had very little funding. We weren't, weren't expected to win. I pulled off the biggest surprise upset in America uh, in 2014. Uh, it was a, a big shocker because nobody was even paying attention to our race as if it wasn't, we had no chance at all. Uh, but as I traveled around the state and people were frustrated with taxes and the economy and the loss of jobs and you know, the middle class, uh, you know, struggling families were really suffering. Small businesses were, were being hurt. But I was surprised as I traveled around the state that everywhere I went, I would sit down with the business community or with the community organization, local elected leaders and say, what's the number one issue or problem that you're facing with in your community? And I kept hearing over and over again, opioids, which, uh, you know, at that time in 2014, we weren't focused enough on. But this wasn't just in inner city Baltimore. It was in the wealthy suburbs of Montgomery County. It was in rural, small rural communities and agricultural communities and out in Western Maryland and on the Eastern shore. And so uh, I immediately, I was the first uh, governor in America to, to declare a state of emergency on the opioid crisis. And we've put a tremendous amount of time and attention to this issue, which is killing people and tearing apart families and communities all across the country. Yeah, I appointed our Lieutenant Governor Boyd Rutherford to head up a, a task force that's still working to this day, fighting this issue. And we were making great progress until COVID hit. And now, you know, unfortunately, this has put a lot of people under stress and um, we're still having major problems with the opioid uh, crisis. You know, Governor, I, I had dinner with Governor Polis here in Denver last week. And one of the things Governor Polis and I were talking about was downtown Denver and how to revitalize downtown Denver. And one of the yeah comments I made to the governor was, well, at least baseball season will get some foot traffic back into downtown Denver, which is very much needed to try and create yeah. kind of a social atmosphere. And the governor turned to me and said, well, if we have a baseball season, and as you well know, the, the, the owners and the players haven't been able to get to an agreement. Isn't baseball super important for cities such as Baltimore and Denver and Seattle as it relates to the revitalization of the downtown urban core post pandemic? Well, it's it's obviously a major part of the issue of getting people downtown and uh, and getting people back to enjoying life again. But when they people come into the city, it's not just the baseball game they attend, but it's the uh, you know the, the the bars and the restaurants that they come and support. It brings people into the city to see you know all the other things it has to offer. And so I was uh, you know also excited about you know the start of baseball season and opening day at Camden Yards and. And uh, rooting on the Orioles, although they haven't been, you know, doing so well on the field, we were hopeful for a season to get started. Uh, and uh, it's a little disappointing. I'm hoping that they can reach agreement, but it looks like we may be delayed by 30 days or so. And I just hope they can reach agreement because it's, you know, it's great for the 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 the, the fans uh, are a big part of, you know, the the kind of pride of the city as well. Yeah. So, Governor, um, soon after you got into office, 89 days to be exact, Freddie Gray dry, died in the back of a police vehicle um, and incited um, a significant amount of, of riots and violence in Baltimore. Um, I've watched what you did. I've read about what you did in your book, and you could teach a Harvard Business School case study on crisis management from the way you handled that situation. Can you walk us through a little bit the major steps you took that night? and what the key elements were of both containing the violence, allowing for peaceful expression of anger, and the general de-escalation of that situation? Yeah, well, so as you point out, it was 89 days since I had been sworn in as governor, and uh, the worst violence in 47 years broke out in our largest city of Baltimore after the death of Freddie Gray. This was not too long after Ferguson 
kind of at the beginnings of the Black Lives Matter movement. And there was legitimate concern in the community about, you know, what happened to this young man. It evolved into some pretty uh, serious uh, violence and riots in the city and, you know, police cars on fire and, you know, businesses and homes being destroyed. Uh, some of it from people from outside the city, but some people with genuine frustrations. They got out of hand. And we had a mayor of Baltimore at the time who was not willing to do anything to stop it. Uh, in fact, went on national TV and said she was going to give the rioters room to destroy. Um, and I decided we were not going to allow it. We, we, we immediately, as soon as it broke out, we were preparing for this for days for the possibility of it happening. We had already put the state police and the National Guard on alert to be ready. And I, that night when the violence broke out, I immediately declared a state of emergency. We sent in 4,000 members of the National Guard and 1,000 police officers to immediately stop all the violence. Uh, and yet we, uh, we, we were very careful about the way we did it. We allowed peaceful protests to go on for a solid week, but we just didn't let people throw bricks through windows or set things on fire. And uh, we let the Baltimore City Police take the front. We backed them up with uh, five different state police agencies and then an outer ring with the, the National Guard for, for, for backup. And, uh, you know, it was, I was reminded of Ronald Reagan, peace through strength, you know, going back to Reagan and my ties there and my admiration for him. I wanted to make sure that we were going to be able to stop the violence because the people in the city were crying out. Uh, they were concerned about their city burning down, but I didn't want to further incite the violence. And so we, we sent an overwhelming force into the city and then didn't use that force. And we, I immediately went into the burning city with my entire command team and senior leadership of state government and stayed there for a week and walked the streets. I met with uh, faith-based leaders and with the NAACP and, uh, you know, went to every neighborhood across, went into West Baltimore the first morning as the sun was coming up with the smoke coming out of a CBS there at kind of ground zero. And then I went and walked Freddie Gray's neighborhood. And we were able to lower the temperature and listen to the legitimate concerns and allow the peaceful protesting, but we totally stopped the violence. And I think it's a, it is a lesson for others that didn't follow that advice. <clears throat> and uh, when we had disturbances uh, last summer and when in cities and there were mayors and governors that didn't do that. Uh, but to your point about teaching a course, I don't know if I can do one at Harvard Business School, but I did teach a course at the National Governors Association on to other governors uh, to, to, about how they should handle uh, a crisis like that. And, uh, you know, maybe I can get a gig at Florida State where my, my alma mater teaching that course. I'm, I'm sure uh, there are plenty of places that would love to hear you <clears throat> talk about that. Governors, you think about race relations in America and your very effective handling of that, both on both sides of it, containing the violence, but at the same time also allowing for the expression of anger and then also peaceful demonstration to say things need to change. How do we change America going forward? Well, I mean, these are issues that we have, we're all we're all grappling with. And I think, again, it goes back to the, the common denominator of, of listening and showing up and reaching across the aisle and working together to try to find common sense solutions. And, you know, I, I the riots in Baltimore back in 2015 was just the start. Uh, we've continued to go back to Baltimore and invested, you know, record funding in education eight years in a row. And you know, tore down the Baltimore City Jail. We, we passed uh, criminal justice reform, one of the most sweeping and the first one in, in, in the country where we uh, reduced our prison population more than 49 other states. Um, we've taken action for reentry programs and job training and workforce development. We've reinvested money into our urban areas and into the black community. We, we have, uh, uh, you know, gone down. We have a group uh, effort called Project Core, where we tore down 8,000 blighted properties and, and started redevelopment in, in, in communities that really needed it. Um, and so working on the root causes of, of these problems, working on police reform, but I was one of the ones that stood up loudly and clearly about against uh, this defunding the police. I, I said, how can you improve policing uh, and, and make reforms without investing more money so we can recruit and retain and do better training and teach de-escalation techniques and pay for body cams. And so we put a half a billion dollar uh, refund the police initiative, putting more money in state and local police and pushing for tougher sentences for uh, violent offenders and people who commit felonies with guns. We've got to get the worst of the worst offenders off the streets. And 
uh, inter- it was interesting to hear President Biden actually come around to that position last night, and some of that, where he's actually supporting it, which I applaud. Uh, but interestingly, those actions that we've taken, going in to keep the people of Baltimore safe, working on doing something about the violent crime and putting more money into police along with all of the social programs and the efforts that we're doing to try to fix the root causes. It's it's very, very popular in Baltimore City and among the black voters of our state. I currently have an 80% approval among black voters. And we have you know uh, some elected officials who have been trying to stop us from those things and saying, you know, you, we need to get rid of the uh, police and we shouldn't put violent criminals in jail. And it's just, there's no one that supports that position. So Governor, um, after the Freddie Gray um, incident and your effective handling of it, um, a couple months later, um, you took your first trade mission to Asia. And while you were there, you came back feeling a little off and you had a lump on your neck. And the next thing you knew, you were being diagnosed with stage three uh, uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, I've read your account of being diagnosed and having the doctors tell you that. Um, and what I found to be very interesting was fast forwarding through all of that and the the the, the shock and the obvious um, very significant concern on your own part as it relates to your health at that moment. But when you got into your SUV to, to drive home, you got in the back and rather than going to your iPhone and going onto WebMD and doing immediate research on Hodgkin's lymphoma or calling your wife or your best friend, you put on Tim McGraw's song, Live Like You Are Dying, and you closed your eyes. Take us back to that moment. Well, it's, uh, you know, I, so I had just been through my first legislative session. We just went through the riots. I had just a few months earlier won the biggest surprise upset in America. And I had no idea that I had health issues, but I was, uh, it, while I was on this trade mission, we were, you know, halfway around the world and we, we were in Korea, China, and Japan. And um, I, I was walking the Great Wall of China and I just, you know, felt like things weren't right. I, I was, things, my back was bothering me on the plane ride over there. And, uh, you know, I, then I, my last day in Japan, a kind of a lump popped out of my, my throat. And I decided that I need to go check this out when I get home. This was feeling a little off, but I, I expect that I just hadn't slept much. I was working hard, uh, long trip. Uh, but as it turns out, I had 40 or 50 tumors that had spread all over my body, which was a complete shock to me. And I was concerned about, you know, how we're going to, how I'm going to deal with that and treat that if, these three doctors had walked into the room and told me this news. And, and uh, I, I was on my, it was Father's Day weekend. And I was uh, Friday afternoon. I was on my way to go tell, see, be with my wife and three daughters. And, and my dad, who was uh, still living at that time, was coming over for a Father's Day weekend. And uh, I was thinking about how I'm going to tell them. And then how do I tell the six million people that had just elected me as their governor that, you know, the, now, now their state was in these uh, potentially shaky hands of somebody that's facing a life threatening. Uh, you know, a cancer diagnosis. And so I was just on the way from the doctor to the governor's mansion. And I'm a, I'm a country music fan. And, a, you know, I like Tim McGraw. And he has this great song called Live Like You Were Dying that talks about making the most out of every day. And I just was trying to gather my thoughts on this like 15 minute ride home. And the first thing I did was just listen to that song. And it kind of spoke to me. I, I printed out the lyrics and I, I played it over and over again. I had the lyrics sitting on my desk and it was quite an ordeal. I went through six months of uh, 24 hour day chemotherapy and multiple surgeries, and it, it was pretty advanced, but I came out of it uh, really strong. And one of the great things, so just to wrap that story up, uh, Tim McGraw, just by chance, happened to be doing a, a benefit for the Children's Hospital at the University of Maryland Medical Center where I was being treated. And I was at the end of my chemo. And I, he, I got to go introduce him. I got to meet him backstage, and you know, I thanked Tim McGraw. Uh, I said, you really inspired me with your song. And he told me how he thinks of his dad, Tim, uh, Tug McGraw, who was a baseball player, died of brain cancer. He said every time he sings the song, and other people tell him how much they connect to it. Uh, and he came out and uh, sang the final, uh, the second encore, final song of the night. He dedicated Live Like You Were Dying to me in a concert full of people. And, you know, tears were rolling down my face. And, uh, you know, it was just really emotional. I appreciated it. And then, uh, you know, as I was kind of limping back to my truck, still really in bad shape from chemo, uh, his manager came out and handed me a guitar that, that uh, Tim McGraw had inscribed on it uh, to the gov, live like you're dying, Tim McGraw. And I have it hanging in my, in my office here in Annapolis. It's one of my favorite possessions. 
So governor, um, beyond living every day, like you're dying, because we all are, um, any other either songs or, if you will, mottos that you turn to from time to time, whether it's either in good times or bad times that keep you headed what you think is in the right direction? Well, you know, we, I, I, I use a lot of Reagan quotes. Uh, I mean, I listen to a lot of country music. I get inspiration from different places. But, uh, you know, I just really, I think that going through that cancer battle, after all the other battles and all the other, you know, uh, victories and losses, I think you learn so much out of the times of adversity. And one thing I just learned, if I didn't already know it, uh, was that I try I just try to make the most out of every day. I give it everything I've got. And, uh, you know, I've only, I've got a, a year, roughly a year left as my term as governor. I'm term limited here uh, till January of 2023. I'm still like running through the tape. I'm still working just as hard every day as I was. There's no, there's, there's no quit. You know, I get up every day trying to say, what else can we accomplish? How can we get more things done? How can we help people? So I, I think it's just, you know, making the most out of every day and, and not letting it, you know, sometimes you, you can prepare for things and, plan sometimes things are going to hit you from out of the blue that you're not expecting like like your largest city breaking out in the riots or a, a scary uh you know personal diagnosis but uh i think just working through those things and and and, and keeping focus and keep moving forward that's that's what i think that's one of the keys to success how important do you think showing that vulnerability and obviously there was no way for you to hide the vulnerability you were you were you were sick and, and had stage three cancer um, yeah. Showing that vulnerability <laughs> to the people who'd elected you. Um, all of us who are leaders to whatever capacity, they're small in my case or in large in your case, want to kind of project this image of invulnerability, you know, invulnerability and that we're out there to lead and that hard things will come along and we can handle them. And you were forced to show a side to your personality and who you were that showed you as vulnerable and human and real. And that's got to play in significantly to your overall persona and the reason Maryland voters are so attracted to you. Do you agree with that? Well, yeah, thank you, Willie. I never, th I never thought of it like that, but it, it's true. I mean, look, I, I think one of the, you know, people often ask me, well, how are you, you know, so popular in a state that's overwhelmingly Democrat and you're a Republican? And I think part of it is people just think I'm a regular guy who tells it like it is. And going through you know, difficult times and showing vulnerability and just letting people see who you really are is something that sometimes politicians don't do. Um, I think I'm always like that and always transparent, whether you like what I have to say or not, you know, I'm just telling, telling you what I really think. I don't, there's not a lot of spin with me. And I think people say to me all the time, I really appreciate you. Or they'll say, I'm a liberal Democrat. You know, I've never even considered voting for Republican, but, and I don't agree with you on everything, but I just, I just think you're a real guy. And they said, you seem like a regular guy. And I go, well, that's because I am a regular guy. Um, and I, I think people appreciate uh, that and going through that, yeah, personal scare with cancer. I mean, you know, I had a beautiful head of hair like yours, only it was white. You know, I looked like a guy that should be on TV. And then, you know, all my hair fell out and the people could see, I mean, right in front of them, I was going through quite a struggle. Uh, but uh, I think, uh, you know, I, you know I, I showed people exactly what was going on. I think they appreciate that I'm, I'm, I'm a real guy that goes through difficult things, just like every, every one of them does and, and, and keeps working hard every day. You wrote eloquently, Governor, about that day that you did go home and you told your wife, Yumi, as well as your family members that you were this diagnosis. And the person who took it the hardest was your dad. Um, talk about that for a moment, because, you know, fortunately, most of us don't get faced with that type of a conversation with our parent. And every parent's worst nightmare is to lose a child before they pass themselves. But that's also yeah. an incredible opportunity for you and your father to share that feeling of the father-son bond that you developed up until then. Well, you know, it was, uh, so I just came home from the doctor and I, you know, first told my wife, Yumi, and, uh, you know, she, she hugged me and said, we're going to get through this together. Um, you know, was, 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 you know, we we're going to say some prayers together. I, my, my daughters then came and everybody cried and hugged each other. Uh, but we all were pretty tough and, you know, they were very supportive and I let them know I was going to make it through and everything was going to be fine. But my dad, who was 85, who I've since lost, and we talked about him so much earlier, uh, he was sober for, for, for a dinner. And, uh, and I had to break the news to my dad and I've never, I had never seen him ever in my life like this. I mean, he, he couldn't eat dinner. He was crying. And I think it's like, no matter how old you get, uh, 
the loss of a child or thinking you might lose your child was something he still, to, to, I'm an old guy, but to my dad, I was still the little kid who he didn't know how to help. Yeah. Yeah. It's an incredible story. And we're all obviously thankful that you um, went through your treatment and that you are cancer free uh, and yeah, have been thank you. for, for uh, almost six years, correct? Yeah. I, I can't thank, I mean, I have incredible doctors and a wonderful support system and millions of people praying for me around Maryland and around the country and the world. And it's just, I got blessed by the Pope and I had prayer vigils at churches of every denomination. It was incredible experience and I couldn't be, you know, I'm stronger than ever now. I just, my hair is not looking so good. <laughs> it's, it's, it's all good. Um, so governor, let's go to something that's, that's, uh, you know, back to sort of, if you will, business from, from the personal. So you ran for reelection and you get reelected and you win by 15 points. Um, as I said previously, first Republican governor to be reelected in the 242 years at that time, now 246 years of the state of, of, of Maryland. Um, how'd you do it? Um, I, I, I remember distinctly, Adrian Fenty, who was the mayor of Washington, D.C., was a, a very good friend of mine. And Adrian ran his first campaign going door to door and putting um, signs in everyone's uh, yard, and it worked masterfully to win his first campaign. But on the second time around, he went back to campaigning the same way he did the first time. And unfortunately, it didn't work the second time. He went back to the same playbook and it didn't happen. So you had that same challenge, if you will, in your reelection. What did you do differently time two to make it so that you won by 15 points? Well, it was a totally different uh, experience. You know, the first time when I ran in 2014, no one had any idea who I was. Uh, we weren't able to raise any money and everything was just, you know, grassroots and shoe leather and hard work. And there was a mood in our state that people, uh, there was, I don't even know who that guy is, but I'm fed up with the taxes. And so I came from nowhere and surprised everyone. When I was an incumbent, that wasn't surprising anyone. I was a, a Republican governor in the bluest state in the country in a state that, uh, you know, Donald Trump lost uh, to, to Hillary by 31 points. And um, it was, was right, right in between, you know, his two elections, uh, he lost to Joe Biden by, by 33 points. And so in right in the middle of that in 2018, I had a, a reelection battle against a really tough opponent who was the uh, past uh, president of the national NAACP in a, in a state that, that's got one of the highest black populations. Uh, and so even though I had a high job approval rating, people liked the job I was doing as governor. Uh, you know, the, the, the President Trump had a, an approval of something like 29% or 30%. And there were a lot of people saying, I'm just going to vote against every Republican just to send a message to Donald Trump. And so we had to overcome that and, and try to let people know that, hey, you, you know, I'm not Donald Trump. And I'm the guy who, who you like, who you think is doing a good job as governor, and you can't take that out on us. And uh, so it was a difficult race. It was a lot easier raising money the second time as an incumbent. And so we didn't have the shoestring campaign. Uh, we, we, but it, we, I still did the same grassroots working hard every day and letting people know we never forgot. We've been every corner of the state and just, uh, it was a, it was a, a tougher race than it turned out to be. I mean, we won in a landslide and I was, as you say, you know, reelected when it doesn't usually happen in our state, but the tide was against us. It was a huge blue wave in a, in a huge blue year in the blue estate. And uh, we won overwhelmingly. And I, I got in that race about 35% of the black vote. I get running against a, a African-American, you know, leader of the NAACP, which goes back to those riots in Baltimore and the, the, the record funding for education and all the efforts. You know, we got a lot of credit. That's, that's something that I don't know that any Republican has ever done. So you mentioned that President Trump, candidate, uh, well, President President elect Trump against Hillary Clinton, and then President Trump against Joe Biden lost by 30 or 33 points in both of them. You won by 15. So you got a 45, if you will, point margin over President Trump. As I hear you say that, it does put into context a little bit your ability to speak your mind and, 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 and if you will, point out issues with President Trump that other governors of redder states that might have a tighter reelection campaign weren't able to do. Is that a, is that a fair assessment? Well, perhaps, but it wouldn't have changed. It, you know, it, it, the politics didn't enter into it. I didn't support Trump in either election and uh, didn't have any problem speaking out against all the things that I thought he was doing wrong. Uh, now, look, I, I worked together with him the whole time he was president. I was chairman of the National Governors Association all through COVID. I had quite a bit of involvement with them. But 
I, I had no hesitation to say what I thought and speak out, even if it was unpopular. Uh, you know, it goes back to my dad, you know, in Watergate with Nixon. He, he, did, he did what he thought was right for the country. And that's I've done what I think is right for my state and what I think is right for the country. And, uh, you know, the, the, the politics were such that, uh, you know, I, I won the same amount of vote among Republicans and base voters as Trump did. But I was able to add to that. Uh, a lot of voters that he turned off. So I told you about the big numbers with black community. I won the Asian vote. I won the Hispanic vote. And I won suburban women overwhelmingly, all areas where President Trump did not do well. And I, I think that's kind of a, that could happen in other places. I think we set an example for, you know, the, a road back for the Republican Party, if you will. You just mentioned, Governor, that you worked with President Trump uh, on numerous occasions. Um, I, I think you said when you were head of the NGA that you had something like 42 meetings with the White House and all the governors at the beginning of or well, at the beginning in, of the pandemic and throughout the early stages of the pandemic. I, I heard you say that, Governor, and I just thought, so we've got 50 chief executives of their own states. We've got the chief executive of the United States of America and then some other staffers. What's a Zoom call with all the governors and the president of the United States like and who actually speaks? Well, so, uh, you know, actually, the, the you know, this is something that's never I don't think it's ever happened uh, ever in the history of our country. And fr quite frankly, you know, the, the governors typically, you know, get together at a governor's conference a couple times a year, maybe for the National Governors Association and either the Democratic governors or Republican governors, you know, maybe quarterly or, you know, two or three times a year, you might see each other. When COVID hit, you know, the governors were on the front line leading, and I, and I was leading the governors, and we had to deal with the federal government on, a, on an almost daily basis. And so when, when uh, I, I had a D.C. conference of the National Governors Association, I was the chair, and I called together all the leaders of the federal government to come address the governors there. As things started to evolve, this was back in February of, uh, of 19, but in, in, uh, as things started to evolve, uh, I got a call from Vice President Pence to come to the Situation Room uh, the first day that they uh, appointed uh, Deborah Birx to try to head up that effort there as a White House coronavirus coordinator, put the first time uh, pre the president uh, appointed the vice president to head it up. And I was there with all the leaders of the federal government. The rest of the governors were on Zoom. Uh, I was in the Situation Room in the White House, and we did a couple of them like that. And then I led uh, on for the governors, all the, I think, 63 or 64 of those Zooms with uh, the, either the president and or the vice president and the entire coronavirus task force. So it would be, you know, uh, the head of NIH and the CDC and FDA and all of the top leaders. And the way it worked was typically I would speak first uh, on behalf of the governors. We would say, you know, I would say, you know, you know th thank them for whatever efforts they're doing and then press the things that were our priorities. You know, we need help on this. It was uh, pushing on testing. It was, uh, you know, we need Title 32 to authorize spending for the National Guard. I would always have, you know, a, a list of five or six things that we needed that day or that week. And then uh, the president or the vice president would, would uh, you know, give their presentation and they'd have some of their cabinet secretaries give us updates. And then later in the, we'd open it up for some dialogue and questions with the other governors. But uh, I, I remember one time in particular after hammering pretty hard, uh, you know, on some things. I started out one of these Zooms with the president uh, saying, Mr. President, I just want to thank you and your team for the great cooperation with the governors. And I, you know, I want to thank you for the success on Operation Warp Speed, which is going to save so many lives. And he says, oh, so you're being nice to me this time. <laughs> you know, he was like, what do you mean, Mr. President? I'm always nice. I think sometimes I ruffled his feathers a little bit, but I was, that was my job. I was working on behalf of the Democrat and and Republican governors and trying to, you know, get what we needed for the states. Do, do you think things came out of those meetings? I, I think about all of us in sort of this Zoom world, Governor, and, you know, I have executive meetings all the time at Walker and Dunlop on Zoom, and I meet with clients on Zoom, and I, and I always sort of wonder how much is actually accomplished as we do them. 50 governors and the, and the President of the United States, did things really come out of those meetings, or was it more of just an information sharing session? Well, no, they, these were early on uh, in the crisis. These were life and death decisions. Yeah. These were people trying to decide decisions that, that potentially are going to save tens of thousands of lives. So it was, these were serious, intense discussions. Uh, you know, I think later in the crisis, it became kind of, you know, as people got used to it and, you know, that they, it became more kind of uh, just sharing of information back and forth. But in the beginning, it was pretty intense. It was, we had never had the leaders of all the states talking with the, 
president, and vice president, all the cabinet secretaries about, you know, things that may potentially, you know, kill a lot of our residents and what, what we were going to do to try to, you know, save lives and livelihoods. It was, it was pretty, uh, pretty intense. And I don't think it's ever happened before. I don't know if it'll ever happen again, but they were productive. Now, I'll say we had really great discussions sometimes with the, the vice president leading when the president wasn't there. I think they were more productive, frankly. Uh, but then there would be a press conference later where, you know, they might say something completely off the wall that was that would kind of ruin some of the progress we made in an hour and a half you know, conversation. Uh, but we'd have to go back and put the pieces back together. I hear you mention uh, Vice President Pence there, and I did one thing in doing research for you that I thought was interesting was that I think I'm correct that um, Vice President Pence was head of the Republican Governors Association when you were first running and put money into your campaign against everyone's um, thoughts that you actually had a fighting chance and that that was a key funding to your 2014 original campaign. Is that Am I correct on that? Well, so the, he, he was he was not, but he was on the executive committee and he's he was involved in the decision. So Chris Christie from New Jersey. Oh, it was Chris Christie. Chairman. That was it. It was Christie. Exactly. Okay. They had spent all of the money on 26 other states that they had targeted. They thought there was no I was on the no way in hell list where they thought I was the least likely to succeed. We're not going to put any money in Maryland. But we had uh, we're tied the race with about 10 days to go. And uh, and so Christie uh, was trying to help help us. But they had spent all the money. And Christie wanted to draw a million dollars on a line of credit that was their operating line to pay for staff for the RGA after the election. They had never done it before. And uh, he didn't have time for an executive committee. So he called Mike Pence to say, uh, I want to talk to you about adding one more race into the mix. Uh, and he said, okay. And he said, I want to talk to you about Maryland. And he, Christie says, there's a long perceptible pause on the other line. And, and, and Mike Pence says, Chris, have you been drinking? <laughs> But he eventually agreed and they uh, they drew on the line and last minute put, put, put a couple of TV commercials in the Washington market and helped us. You know, we were already at the goal line and they helped uh, push us over. So your term ends in January of 2023, Governor. Um, you've said you won't run for Senate, which allowed Chris Van Hollen to actually get a good night's sleep on February 8th. Uh, the day you announced you won't run for Senate. Um, and I, but you I even called Chris. Van Hollen to tell him, uh, you know, that's that's the bipartisanship there. Like you, you can go ahead and get a good night's sleep tonight. I'm not going to run against you. Uh, the poll showed me beating him by 12. So he was he was losing a little sleep, I think. So but you haven't ruled out running for president. And uh, you've also said you haven't ruled out running for president, regardless of whether former President Trump is in the race or not. So what's the calculus between now and next January? You know, honestly, the real calculus is I'm just focused and it. It, it may sound like it's a, I'm giving you some spin, but it's really the, the truth. I'm, I'm going to finish focusing on, you know, every day being the best governor I can be. I want to run through the tape. I want to finish the job. Um, I want to give the taxpayers of Maryland their money's worth every single day and keep solving problems and keep making progress. And so I'm, I'm not even thinking about the politics. And, um, and I've said that I, I'm going to finish this job in, in January, in 23, uh, January of 23, I just didn't rule it out. I've never talked about running for president. I've never said I wanted to run for president. There are people asking me to consider it. And I said, let's just, you know, finish the job at hand. I, I don't like it when people are focused on the next job. But in, after I'm done, uh, in, in, you know, next year, uh, I, I've certainly I said I was going to be willing to sit down and, and talk about that. I don't know what the lay of the land looks like, but I'm very concerned about my Republican Party. And I'm very concerned about the uh, about the country. And if I, I want to be a part, I want to be a part of the discussion. Uh, you know, I, I want to do everything I can uh, and contribute where, where I can. But I, I don't know at this point, you know, exactly, you know, what that path is going to be. So I want to ask you about two big issues before we end and run out of time. Um, the first is COVID and the second is Ukraine. Um, I watched an interview you did on Face the Nation on January 16th, so only six weeks ago. And in that, you had just called up a thousand uh, troops from the National Guard. You'd committed to distributing 20 million N95 and KN95 masks. And here we are a seemingly very short period of time later. The CDC has just withdrawn their indoor mask guidelines, and most people feel like the pandemic is done. Are we done, Governor? Well, you know, we're certainly, I think, done uh, through this, this latest uh, 
Omicron surge uh, in most of the country. In Maryland, um, you know, we now have, we're one of the most vaccinated states in, in America, and we've taken this very, very seriously. Um, we did have a pretty alarming surge uh, that, that spiked straight up like most people did. And then luckily, uh, we, we've got it down. We're down 95% on our hospitalizations. We have the lowest case rate in America, the lowest positivity rate in America. So we're very hopeful. Um, I, I don't think we can say that we're done. I think everybody is ready to get back to normal. You know, we've got everything open. We don't have a mask mandate. Nearly everyone is vaccinated. Hospitalizations are way, way down. Uh, so we're in a very hopeful, positive place. And I think we need to continue to move forward. Um, we've got one of the best economic recoveries in America because we've been so successful on, on COVID and we, we've kept everything open and kept people working. But, you know, this virus is not going away. And so we want to fin finish getting people boosted so they have as much immunity as they, they can get. And we want in some of the states that aren't doing as well, we'd, we'd like to see them make some more progress. But and this thing is going to keep mutating. And, uh, you know, this virus is not gone. It's not eradicated. But we're in a much, much better place. And we're hopeful that uh, we've seen the worst of it. I will point out, Governor, that response is very in line with uh, I've watched you speak about this many, many times in going and, and, and researching for this. And what I found to be so interesting about your response, even in the depths of the pandemic, was it was always a transparent view with data that gave the truth and yet also maintained some hope. And um, I had Harvard Business School professor Nancy Kane on the Walker webcast in the depths of the pandemic talking about great leadership. And one of the things that she talked about was Sir Ernest Shackleton and how he kept his crew of his ship moving forward and, and giving them hope for a day that they would get off the ice sheet, but not by trying to sort of paint it all with, oh, we're gonna yeah. get out of here tomorrow, but giving them realistic data on, this is what we need to do to get there. Don't lose hope that we can, but at the same time, it's gonna be a really, really hard drive to get there. And I would, I would just point out that having watched you talk about this, you know, I'm sure in your in your world too much over the last yeah. two years, it's been really impressive the way that you have given people hope that we're going to get to the other side of it and the same time not sort of shied away from the data or the reality of how how dangerous this virus is. Well, yeah, thank you for pointing that out. I, I, look, I believe a couple of things that we did well. One, one was I surrounded myself with the smartest people I could find with epidemiologists and virologists and public health doctors and people in the business community and tried to, you know, we, we had an incredible team of people working on this day and night for two years. It's not the way any of us wanted to spend our last two years. But so we, we made really good decisions based on lots of data and input, and we were tracking it, you know, hour by hour. But then I also thought it was critically important that we had clear and consistent and direct and honest messaging. Um, I wanted to give people the facts, but the facts were kind of scary. And so I did try to be hopeful without whitewashing the, the seriousness of what we were dealing with. And it, it, it seems to have worked. As I said, we've had, if not the best, certainly one of the best responses to the virus in the entire country. I think we have something like 86% approval of our handling of the virus, which is kind of amazing. Um, it was, there were some tough times, but we made the decisions and then we told people what the decisions were and why we were making them and you know how things were gonna get better. Uh, I think that, that, that was, we did try to be hopeful and clear and honest. So finally, um, Governor, on Ukraine, we're all watching um, that situation unfold with varying degrees um, of frustration, anger, fear, a bunch of other emotions. Um, as I've read about it, one of the interesting things that I've read is this the, the, the stability instability paradox that because Russia has such a large nuclear arsenal and the United States does, that means that it's unlikely we get to World War III, but it also ties our hands from taking more aggressive military action to try and stop what they're doing. Um, if you were down the road from where you are in Annapolis in, on Pennsylvania Avenue, anything you'd be doing differently today as it relates to the conflict in Ukraine? Well, uh, first of all, I, you know, my my uh, thoughts and prayers go out to the people of Ukraine. And, and, and I can't tell you how impressed I've been with their their bravery. And, uh, you know, Zelensky, I think, has done just an incredible uh, job. And to see the, the, the world leaders come together in support. You know, I I uh, went to uh, a, a Ukrainian a Catholic church in Baltimore on Monday and and just to let the community know that we're all behind them and. 
and uh, was, you know, hugging and crying with some folks who were really worried about their loved ones back in, in Ukraine. Tonight here at our state house, we're, we have a, a, a big vigil uh, where we, we're going to rally people to just let them know that we're in solidarity with the people of Ukraine. Um, and I, and I'm, I, I'm very uh, uh, thankful for the fact that, you know, for the first time we have in a long time, and I, and I think Putin probably inadvertently you know, was responsible for creating this, but uh, a really united NATO and an EU and and kind of people around the world rallying. Uh, we're seeing that th this nation, you know, fight for their freedom and fight for their homeland with everything they've got. And it's been truly inspiring. I, I think, you know, I, I don't want to second guess or Monday morning quarterback or, you know, question the president, but I, I think, you know, we could have been a little tougher a little sooner. I, I, I think, you know, to a certain extent, we were leading from behind and we let Europe move ahead of us. I, I think, you know, sanctions are the way, you know, we have to deal with this, but I think we could have imposed them uh, before the fact rather than after the fact and maybe gone all the way. I think we've got to look at energy uh, policy a little differently. I, I like some of what the president was was uh, saying and doing uh, as of last night. But I think, you know, we've got to worry about going back to Reagan uh, and, and, and you know, th this is a totally different uh, time, uh, but with similar kinds of issues, eerily similar. And Putin uh, is, a, is, is just, a, I think, potentially an irrational actor. We don't know how he's going to, I feel like he's backed into a corner, don't know how he's going to lash out. We're not in a position, I think, to, to, and shouldn't be uh, intervening militarily, but we should do everything we possibly can to support uh, Ukraine and uh, I, with with uh, all of the uh, cap armament capabilities and all the funding. You know, we ought to take every step we can take on on uh, on uh, sanctions. And quite frankly, we've got to start thinking about our defense spending. And uh, you know, for for the first time, people are understanding that the world is still a dangerous place and. America still needs to be a leader of the free world. We, we have a defense authorization bill that's coming up in about eight or nine days. And uh, I hear no talk about, about that in the president's speech, but we're going to have to make sure that we, we provide the, uh, the, the military with the resources we need. So finally, Governor, a quote from you that I'd love to get you to just talk about how you keep this going forward, which is, first of all, you are the most popular governor in America. Uh, and you've said, quote, successful politics is about addition and multiplication, not subtraction and division. It feels to many of us that we are in a world, a political world that is all about subtraction and division. So how do we get our politics back more focused on addition and multiplication? Well, it's uh, it's something that I'm really focused on. And, and when in addition to my day job and working hard for the people of Maryland, when when I do involve myself in political activities across the country on a, or on a national basis. It's what I've, it's what I've been talking about and what I've been focused on here for, for nearly eight years. And it's what I think is critically important. I think, you know, toxic politics is tearing America apart. Uh, it was Ronald Reagan, uh, you know, was a guy who did, it really comes back from Reagan's time talking about, you know, addition and multiplication, not subtraction and division. And we have been doing a whole lot of subtracting and dividing. You know, I was able to kind of build these coalitions. I didn't just win with base Republican voters, but I got the support of, of nearly all of the independents in the state and a large chunk of discerning Democrats. And we went into areas where most Republicans never go. And we tried to talk about uh, solutions. And, you know, we've worked together with people on the other side of the aisle. I think it's what America's hungry for. Uh, you know, it's the loudest voices seem to get the most attention the most radical and frankly in both parties, but they're a very small minority. And I, I think more than 70% of the people in America really do want, to, they're frustrated with the Democrats and the Republicans with the anger, the finger pointing and the name calling in Washington and the lack of getting anything done, the divisiveness and the dysfunction, and they want to fix it. And so I really do, I wrote a book about, I touched on some of this, you know, what do we do about overcoming the toxic politics in America? I think it's, it's critically important for our democracy. And I believe strongly in a competitive two-party system. And I think we've got to you know, get back to uh, trying to find a, a, a way to uh, have a, you can disagree passionately on issues uh, while still being civil and without attacking or demeaning the person that disagrees with you or, or, or doubting their patriotism or attacking them as a person. We've got to get back to you know, kind of working together to, to fix things for the American people. We've got serious problems that need to be addressed. 
Well, Governor, as um, the CEO of a company based in your great state, uh, with many, many. Thank you for that. We know you have a proud history here in Maryland. We we do, and it's great. And I appreciate the tax revenue. You're you're very welcome, and we've grown to create more of it. So, uh, Mm -hmm. Governor, thank you. You've been very generous with your time. It's uh, fantastic all you've done for the great state of Maryland. Good luck in the rest of your term, and we're all waiting with bated breath to see whether you decide that you're going to run for the presidency in 2024. And if you do, if you do, uh, good luck to you. Well, Willie, thank you so much for the opportunity. And again, congratulations to you and the company. We appreciate all of that revenue you've been generating here and all the growth of, you know, we're so happy that we'll be able to call you a Marylander. Sorry. Great. Yeah, that's exactly right. Well, thank you, Governor. Have a great day. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.